Good morning, church. Let's stand. Let's worship the Lord this morning. Come on, put your hands together. Let's praise Him. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. Lord, you are good and your mercy endureth forever. From every nation and tongue, from generation to generation, we to coming for baptism, uh, knowing there's nothing special about this water, but baptism is an outward expression of an inward transformation. So first, we have Miss Michelle. Uh, so uh, Michelle has been um, just, she's friends with a member of our church, and they've been talking a lot, had a lot of conversations, and um, you know, she's just been moving through her faith and just getting things uh, together. And uh, then after a couple of weeks, she talked with one of our decision counselors and said, look, I need to get all this in the right order. And so coming today in believer's baptism. And so 
Uh, Michelle, it is my joy, but it is also my responsibility to ask you who is Lord of your life. With that profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And next we have Malaya. Um, so uh, Malaya is one of our um, one of our high school students, and uh, she has been spending time just talking to uh, Miss Naomi and other people of our student ministry, and just today coming forward today uh, in in believers baptism. So Malaya, it's my joy, but it's also my responsibility to ask you who is Lord of your life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> With that profession of faith, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Well, amen. We had the uh, opportunity to baptize three in our first service. And so we're so thankful that God, <laughs> that God still honors the preaching and the teaching and the sharing of the good news of Jesus Christ. And we uh, get to see the fruit of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Hey, let me welcome you. Thank you for coming and thank you for being here today. Uh, Many of you, last Sunday was the first time you ever visited us and you chose to come back again this week. Uh, A lot different this week than it was last week, isn't it? Uh, Yeah, yeah. but I tell you what, last week, man, we we look forward to Easter every single year because what happens is usually the church family will all come on that one Sunday and uh, we get to see a lot of guests that come and get to hear the good news of Jesus Christ Uh, Last Sunday, uh, these are some numbers that I was given. Last Sunday, uh, we had over 200 that were very first-time guests to be in services here at Highland Park. And so, uh, if that was you, we're glad that you chose to come back week number two, that we didn't scare you too bad. Uh, We also have uh, attendance numbers from last week. Uh, uh, Overall, our Highland Park family, that would be here. That would be our Windmark Beach location as well. Last Sunday, we had 5,400 in attendance. And so we're thankful for that. They had had 1,800 at the Windmark Beach campus last week. And so 3,600 here on the main campus And uh, last week we had here on the main campus uh, 314 individuals that indicated that they had made a spiritual decision of that 231 salvations. And so we're thankful for that. Hey, be in prayer for our staff and some deacons and some other counselors as we're reaching out to do follow-up. Maybe you were part of those who indicated that you'd given your life to Christ or you've got questions about baptism or how you can be a member of our church. Uh, Hey, you don't even have to wait. Let us encourage you before you leave today. Come to the Welcome Center or at the end of the service, we'll have an invitation. We would invite you to come down and share that with one of our pastors so that we can continue to walk with you as you have made this decision to follow Jesus Christ. If you are visiting with us today, you could kind of help us out. You could fill out one of our guest registration cards. We do have physical cards that are in the chair back pockets all around this room. You can grab one of those, fill it out. They're going to pass the offering bucket in just a moment. You can drop that in the bucket. Or if you'd like to do it electronically, you'll see a slide that comes up on the screens right at the end of the service. There'll be a lot of boxes on that slide. One box will say guest, and you text the word guest to the phone number that's on the screen. That'll go to our staff, and they'll reach out to you to get your information as our guest. But let us encourage this. If you've never stopped by the Welcome Center, please do that before you leave today. We're going to give you some information, and we can answer those questions that you have face-to-face. There'll be folks out there to pray with you, to help you in any way that they can. But thank you for coming today. You are our honored guest. I want to go ahead and ask our ushers if they would go ahead and come forward this morning as we continue to worship by giving our tithe and giving our offering. You can give by placing something physical in the bucket, whether that be cash or check, or you can give electronically. You'll see through the screen 
change the way that you can do our text to give. Today, this is an act of worship, just like we would sing a song, as we just did, as an act of worship. You know, maybe if you're new to church and you're like, I don't really understand why we gather and why we sing. The Bible says this, God delights in the praises of his people. God delights it when we worship him through song. That that is a way that we're able to express through words what is the condition or what is the attitude of our heart. And God delights that. And so today, when we continue in worship through singing, understand that you're not singing to just take up time or you're not just singing because we have folks on the stage that are singing, but instead you're singing to an audience of one, and that is God himself. Likewise, today we give to an audience of one. I think you would all agree that we have all been blessed beyond measure, that if there's anything good we have in our life, it has come from the very hand of God. And so today we return a portion of that to him. And it is an act of faith where we say, God, our faith and trust is not in us. It's not in our resources. It is in you, the one who meets our needs and the one who gives us And so today, let us encourage you to do that. In just a moment, we'll sing a few more songs, then I'll come back and preach. If Naturally, if you got to go to the restroom, uh, that would be the time to do that before we open up God's Word and start preaching. We have children's ministry and preschool ministry that's available. So if your kid kind of gets out of hand, we would encourage you to take them. You're like, what does out of hand mean? I don't know. You'll figure it out. You're pretty smart, right? Uh, But we're thankful that you're here today, and we have a full family ministry that we would love for you to be a part of. Lord Jesus, thank you so much that we can gather in this place today. Thank you for what we've seen today, these two through baptism, the three in the first service. Thank you for the beautiful, beautiful reminder of the change and the forgiveness that occurs in salvation when someone turns to you. Thank you, Jesus, that there is not any of us in this room that has sinned too much to be forgiven by you. Thank you, Jesus, that you love us. And we know the Bible tells us that we love you because you first loved us. And we do love you. Thank you that we can gather in this place today and sing praises unto you. Thank you that we can even give back to you right now. God, we know that you don't need a single thing from us. But thank you that you do let us give and that you use our obedience and our giving to spread the good news far and wide. And so we humble ourselves today and we give. Lord, we give our worship. We give our praise. We give our all. And our prayer is that your spirit would roam freely across this place, speaking to our hearts, take captive our ears and our minds. And Lord, may you accomplish the miraculous today. For all the many other things that are happening across this campus today, those that are meeting in small life groups right now, we pray that you'd bless it. For the children, the preschool, God, may you bless that as well. For those that are out at the Windmark Beach campus, God, bless them. And may the name of Jesus be the name that is exalted highly above every other name. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you for loving us. Most of all, that you'd be willing to die for us while we were still your enemy. We pray this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. I know someone who knows what I'm up against. I know someone here in the midst of it fighting for me in a battle I could never win all on my own I might not be able to part the waters I might not be able to calm the storm might not be able to make my giants fall good thing I'm not alone cause there is a power I'm not afraid of what's ahead. I'm standing in the confidence that even though I can't, my God can. He'll heal those who hurt and comfort every broken heart. Restore the homes of families who've been torn apart.
Praise them. Pray with me. Heavenly Father, we praise you this morning. Lord, we thank you for your faithfulness. Lord, we thank you for how much you love us. Lord, we thank you most of all for Jesus, Lord. Lord, thank you for this moment, this time that we have, Lord, just to open your word. We just pray you'd open our minds and our hearts and our hearts to what you have for us, Lord. We'll just give you all the praise, Lord, in the precious, powerful, mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Hey, go ahead and grab a Bible if you have one this morning. Open up to John chapter 11. We will have the scripture on the screens if you don't have a Bible. But if you have one, open it up. John chapter 11. Uh, I'll say this. Um, it, it's, it's kind of interesting. In the first service, we, we, we kind of found out what, uh, what we tend to find out. Uh, you know, uh, I, 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 I talked with the, uh, the tech team this week, and I said, all right, listen, we want to we wanna back the volume way down, uh, and so we can get it where we want it, and so we back the volume way down. After the first service, uh, I don't know, probably, probably, probably had four times as many people that came and said, my goodness, I could barely hear what was going on. And then we, had, then we had folks that came and said, thank you so much. The volume was just perfect. And, uh, and so we're trying to figure out uh, kind of where that sweet spot is. But here's the reality, okay? In a room this size, it's kind of like temperature. There's some that are freezing. There's some that are hot. Uh, you know, and I just say, if you tend to be cold, bring a sweater. If you tend to be hot, don't wear a tank top, just sweat, okay? Um, but in a room this size with this many people and many, uh, this many opinions, it's a very, very, very hard thing to regulate. I will tell you something that I read a few years ago, and I don't even trust my ears anymore. I got 53-year-old ears, and you know, my goodness, I've probably probably done some damage to those over the years. But I read this a few years ago that the older you get, there are physiological changes to your hearing. And it's not necessarily a volume thing as much as it is a pitch thing. And so I just say all that to say, we're doing everything we can to get it in that sweet spot if there is a sweet spot that exists. And so I've asked some folks uh, to uh, to kind of help us with that is that are that are seated all around this room, and so in order for you to know who is helping us make that decision, I'm going to ask them to stand. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just teasing. I'm just teasing. But anyway, problems of a growing church, right? Uh, but we appreciate you guys helping us with that. Uh, just to understand, we're doing everything we can, and there are always people on every single side of any kind of issue. But here's the issue that we will never, ever change on. Salvation is by faith and faith alone in Jesus Christ. We'll say it softly, we'll say it loudly, we'll shout it from the mountaintops, and we'll speak it in the quietness of prayers. Jesus is what unites us all, okay? So bear with us. They're trying to figure out all this stuff, and uh, this is something that happens pretty regularly, especially after we have a big concert. That usually tends to be uh, the case. We're in John chapter 11 today, and you can tell by looking at the title of the message, Who's Calling the Shots? Who's Calling the Shots? Again, I'd like to let you know when it comes to volume, that'd not be me. Um, find some, no, I'm just teasing. Um, who's calling the shots? Now, there are many of you, I don't know if you've been listening to it, but if you've not, let me encourage you. I do a podcast every single week entitled Unchangeable Truth. And what we do is we take the sermon from the previous Sunday and we dig a little bit deeper 
It's also an opportunity for you to submit questions that you may have that have come about as a result of the message. And so it's called Unchangeable Truth. You can find that on Spotify. You can find that on Apple Podcasts. I think you can even find it through our website. But let me encourage you, if you've not subscribed to that, go ahead and do that. And we have archived on there, my goodness, well over a year's worth, maybe two years worth. I don't know, but uh, just a kind of a help for you, okay, as we dig just a little bit deeper. But John chapter 11, and today we're going to be looking at verses 45 all the way down to the end of chapter 11, which would be verse 57. Who's calling the shots? Do you know we all like to be in control? We literally do. And my bubble got burst this week when I found out something that I was completely unaware of. When I get in the elevator, this is usually what happens. I'll get in the elevator, I'll press the floor that I want to go to, and then I'll press that next button, close the door. Do you know I found out this week that or sometime in the 90s when the ADA changed some of their regulations, that in most elevators, that button does not even work. It doesn't do anything. You press the closed door button and nothing, okay? And uh, you're like, why do they even have it there? Well, it's a placebo for you and I, I guess. I don't know. Now, they have it there, and if a fireman comes along and he inserts his key, then it does work. But... We like to be in control. We like to be in charge. The, uh, the New York Times did a story about this a while back. And in that story, there was a psychologist from Harvard by the name of Ellen Langer. And here's what she said. She said, there's a reason that we stand there and we press a button that is non-functioning. Listen to what she said. She said, perceived control is very important. It diminishes stress and it promotes well-being. When you find yourself pressing a non-functional closed door button and later the doors close, you'll probably never notice the delay because a little spurt of happiness will cascade through your brain once you see what you believe is a response to your action. See, all elevator doors are programmed to stay open and then close three seconds later. But we have this idea we're the ones that have caused it to close. Everyone likes to be in control. The very first church that I ever pastored, a small little church in North Mississippi, had a worship center that would seat about 200 people. And on either side of that worship center were two thermostats. And so I would be in there because I was the only one on staff, right? I was the pastor, and I was the secretary, and I was the custodian, and I was the janitor. And, I, you know, if a light went out, I would change the light. And, you know, that's the case for most small churches. And so, uh, anyway, I'd be in there during the week, and I'd be doing something in the uh, worship center, in the sanctuary, and I'd get hot, and I'd walk over, and I'd turn it down, but I would notice it would never get cool. And then I would go over to the other side, and I would turn that one down, and I would notice it would never get cool. And after a while, I spoke to one of the old-timers that had been there, and I'm like, look, I don't understand. I think something may be wrong with the air conditioning. It makes no sense, though, because it works on Sunday, but during the week, I'll turn that thing down, and it will not cool off. And he said, which thermostats are you pressing? I'm like, both of them. He goes, the ones in the worship center? I said, yeah. He goes, well, those are dummies. (laughs) Those don't work. He says, they're not hooked up to anything. He said, the one that really controls it all is in the closet behind the stage. I said, why do you have the two that are in the worship center? He said, because we have a bunch of people around here that want to control it all. And he said, so there are folks that they get cold and they'll walk over and they'll punch the buttons and raise the temp. Or there are folks that get hot and they'll go over and they'll press it down. And they think everything's okay because they're in control. He said, but really, they're not doing anything. We like to be in control, don't we? And ladies, I even hate to mention this, but what about men and the remote control? We like to be in control. Well, today we're going to be looking at a particular passage of Scripture in John chapter 11 that is going to tell us that when everything is said and done, God ultimately is in control. 
John chapter 11, if you were here two weeks ago when we were walking through John, Jesus has raised Lazarus from the dead. He was in the tomb for four days. We saw last time that a lot of people believed in Jesus. Why? Because he raised him from the dead. Yet not everyone believed that Jesus was indeed God. You would think everyone would believe after a miracle like that, but yet some were skeptical. Now, with that being said, look in our text, John chapter 11, beginning in verse 45, going down to verse 57. It said that many of the Jews who had come to Mary and had seen the things that Jesus did, again, raising Lazarus from the dead, they believed in him. But some of them went away to the Pharisees, and they told them the things Jesus did. And then the chief priest and the Pharisees gathered a council and said, What shall we do? For this man works many signs. If we let him alone like this, everyone will believe in him. And the Romans will come, and they'll take away both our place and our nation. Here's what they said. He's messing up our gig. One of them, Caiaphas, being high priest that year, said to them, you know nothing at all. Sounds like a politician, doesn't it? You know nothing at all. Nor do you consider that it is expedient for us that one man should die for the people and not that the whole nation should perish. Now this he did not say on his own authority, but being high priest that year, he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation. You're like, man, he was a prophet. No, no, no. He was speaking on behalf of God. He just didn't know it. Verse 52. And not for that nation only, but also that he would gather together in one, in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. And then from that day on, they plotted to put Jesus to death. And therefore, Jesus no longer walked openly among the Jews. But he went from there into the country near the wilderness to a city called Ephraim. And there remained with his disciples. The Passover of the Jews was near. Many went from the country up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. And then they sought Jesus. And they spoke among themselves as they stood in the temple. What do you think? That he'll not come to the feast? Now both the chief priest and the Pharisees had given a command that if anyone knew where Jesus was, he should report it that they might seize Jesus. Now, again, to me, this is one of the most interesting passages in all of the Bible because it shows here that God has the power to speak through someone. In this case, Caiaphas, the high priest, without Caiaphas even realizing what is happening. Now, all throughout the book of John, here's what we have seen. We have seen his enemies growing more restless that over and over again they've tried to stone him, right? Over and over again they've tried to arrest him. They've opposed him. And finally, after this miracle of raising Lazarus from the dead, they realize we got to do something. This is messing up everything. There are people that usually, religiously, are following what we say, and they're leaving us, and now they're following him. He, he's stealing our flock, and so they decided they're going to kill him. And for these Jewish leaders, there was a crisis that was taking place. It was not only a religious crisis, but it was also a political crisis. Now, we would sit there and say, well, hang on just a second. I thought the Romans were in charge. What do these Jewish leaders have to do with anything? Even though the Romans were in charge, they still allowed the Jewish leaders to control the religion. And so that's what was taking place. And so they had a religious crisis, but they also had a political crisis. My goodness, doesn't it sound like the world that we live in today? A political crisis, yet I would say we have a spiritual crisis in our nation. And I see some similarities between this passage and the time that you and I find ourselves living in. Now, with that being said, there are two things that I want you to see, and we'll kind of flesh this out just a little bit, so bear with us. But first of all, I want you to see some common crisis reactions. And by that, I mean this, that every single one of us is going to respond in one of these three ways when we find ourselves dealing with a crisis. The first one is panic. Panic says everything's out of control. Oh my goodness, what, what am I going to do? Everything is out of control. That's, when it, that's what was taking place here with the Jewish religious leadership. 
Now, the Jewish religious leadership, they were divided between two parties who never, ever got along. You had the Pharisees. The Pharisees were the conservatives. And you had the Sadducees. The Sadducees were the liberals, and they were always fighting. Does that sound familiar? The only thing that they could agree upon is we've got to do something about Jesus. Jesus is messing it up for all of us. And some of the leaders were filled with panic. They said the situation is out of control. If we don't do something about Jesus, not only is it going to mess up what religiously we've got going on, but then the Romans are going to seize control of what we are in control of, and it is going to destroy the nation. So they had some that were worried individuals. Maybe that describes you today. It's not a political crisis for you, and it may not be a a spiritual or a religious crisis for you, but you find yourself in a crisis. And maybe you're one of those individuals, kind of like these guys, your default button is worst case scenario. Oh man, this is just going to be terrible. I can see what is going to happen. It is just going to, it is going to be completely destructive. Worst case scenario. And today there are people that are just like that. Chronic warriors. When faced with a crisis, automatically this is going to be the worst thing ever. You know, there are some people that are that way when it comes to our nation today. There are some people say that our nation is more divided today than it has ever been. Now, I would agree with this. Probably more divided in my lifetime than it's ever been. But there was a thing called the Civil War which wasn't very civil, by the way. Did you know that more Americans were killed in the Civil War than World War I, World War II, Korea, and Vietnam all combined together? But if your default is worst case, then you're going to lean that way. Do you know the Bible talks about those who worry? The Bible has something to say about anxiety. The Bible has something to say about those who naturally kind of fall over into that. Everything is wrong. I'm panicking. And you know who wrote about it? A guy by the name of Paul. Paul wrote about it when he was in prison. He was in a dungeon. I would have to say if there's a worst case scenario, being in prison or a dungeon because of your faith probably would be it. Yet I want you to hear what Paul says to you and I. He wrote this over in the book of Philippians, a New Testament book, chapter 4, verses 6 and 7. Look at the screens. Be anxious about nothing. Somebody needs to highlight that in their Bible. Be anxious about nothing but in everything. By prayer and supplications, let your requests be made unto God. And then what will happen? The peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds. You've heard me say this before, that prayer and worry are impossible to happen at the same time. It is impossible to take place. That if you find yourself worst case scenario, you find yourself panicking, you find yourself worrying and having anxiety, then turn to prayer It's impossible to be worried while you're praying, but when you stop praying, guess what comes? Worry. Is that you? Do you react when a crisis comes with worst case panic? But then there's a second common crisis reaction. Pride. And here's what pride says. I'm in control. That was Caiaphas. The high priest that we read about in this passage of Scripture. Now, during this time, the high priest was appointed by the Roman authorities. And the Roman authorities would appoint someone who paid for their appointment. So Caiaphas was, he was the high priest for 18 years. He was very wealthy. He was able to pay for that appointment for 18 years. Not only was he very wealthy, but he was also brutal. He was a member of the more liberal sect, the Sadducees. The Sadducees, they didn't believe in the miracles of the Bible. The Sadducees did not believe in angels. The Sadducees did not believe in a literal heaven. 
The Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection from the grave. That's the reason why the old country preacher used to say that's why they were sad, you see. (laughs) That was Caiaphas. The Pharisees hated the Romans. The Sadducees, like Caiaphas, were partners with the Romans. The Sadducees would even dress like the Romans. The Sadducees would observe Roman customs. It really was like the Jewish mafia. And here's Caiaphas, and Caiaphas is the godfather. And Caiaphas comes along and he says, hey, listen, we must kill Jesus. It'd be a lot better for one man to die than for our whole nation to perish. I got a plan. I'm going to fix this. Don't worry about it. I got it all under control. He was a fixer. You know what? I'm going to find somebody on the inside and I'll make him an offer he cannot refuse. And we know that would be Judas. Here's Caiaphas. Caiaphas is an example of what you and I would call a self-centered man who thinks that he controls his own destiny. Again, when there is a problem, I just got to work harder. I've just got to get smarter. I can fix this problem and this crisis. And the difficulty with that is those types of people see no need for God. Hey, God, you're busy. Don't, don't, don't worry about it. I got this one under control. I, I know this is a crisis, but I, it's not that big of a deal. I can handle this. I can fix this. Do you know that there are a lot of people in the world and even in the church that have pride? There's a humanist movement that is happening not only across the world, but within our nation today that says this, we can solve our own problems that we do not need God. And here's how it usually goes. If we could just fix our economy, then all of our problems would be right. If we could just bring down the price of gasoline, then all of our problems would be right. If we could just increase our military, then all of our problems will be fixed. If we could just settle what's happening in the Middle East, then everything would be fine. You know what? If we could just get the right person in office, then everything will be okay. If we, could just, if, we could just, if we could just come up with the right rules, then all of a sudden those rules will, will get rid of all the violence that is taking place and will be fixed. This morning as I was getting ready to come to church, I had on the news and I was watching someone that was saying the greatest problem that is happening within our nation is the violence that is coming from lack of gun control. And they said that what needs to happen within our nation is that we need gun control. But friend, listen to me. The problem with violence isn't gun control. It's like we think that we can legislate morality. The problem with violence is it is the problem of a sinful human heart. The heart of the problem is the problem of the heart. Over in the book of Jeremiah in the Old Testament, it says the heart is deceitful. The heart is deceptively and desperately wicked. Yet there are many people, even with our nation, who say that we can solve our own problems and we don't need God. Some of you guys will remember the name Timothy McVeigh. The late 90s, the Bomber in Oklahoma City who killed 168 people. Just before McVeigh was executed, his very last words that he said is he actually quoted the poem Invictus. The final stanza of that, the final words that came out of his mouth, here's what they were. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. But ladies and gentlemen, I promise you, seconds after he died, he found out he was not in charge of his fate, nor was he the captain of his soul. So a common crisis reaction, panic, everything's out of control. Is that you? Or pride. I'm in control. I can fix this. I have no need of help from anyone, especially God. But then there's a third reaction. Promise. And by promise, I mean God's promise. Because promise says this, 
God is in control. Do you know that should be our reaction to any crisis that you find yourself facing? God is in control. He's in control. We have assurance with God. You're like, insurance is very important. We all need insurance. I didn't say insurance. I said assurance. Assurance is a lot better than insurance. Insurance, you're, you're, you're betting that things will go wrong, so you'll be covered when those things do go wrong. With assurance, you know that no matter what happens, God is in control. We have assurance with God. Doesn't matter the nature of the crisis that we're facing. It doesn't matter the severity of the crisis that we find ourselves in. God is in control. It may be a personal crisis. It might be a national crisis. It could even be a global crisis. God is in control. We see this in what John says about the statement here that Caiaphas makes. Look back in verse 51 and 52. He, he's, putting, he's talking about putting Jesus to death. In verse 51, Now this Caiaphas did not say on his own authority, but being high priest. That year he prophesied that Jesus would die for the nation, and not for the nation only, but also that he would gather together in one the children of God who were scattered abroad. Here's mean, old, rich, brutal Caiaphas. He's thinking that he's saying Jesus would die instead of the nation, but God turned it around. God said Jesus will die for the nation, and not just the nation of Israel. God said Jesus will die on behalf of anyone who will come to him in faith and trust. He died for you, and today he longs for you to submit your life to him and trust him for the salvation that you need. I mean, does that show you how awesome of a God we serve? Caiaphas is making a statement here, and God's like, yeah, yeah, you're prophesying that he is indeed going to die, but you have no idea what you're saying. I'm telling you, it's going to be more than just for the nation of Israel. It's going to be more than just preserving the little life that you're thinking is going to happen. I'm telling you, I'll save the lives of men, women, boy, and girl that will come to me in faith. Give him praise and glory this morning for that. Man, there are so many pictures out there that tell us that God is in control. There's one found in Scripture. It's in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. King David writes these words. Hopefully you can agree with what David said. This is verses 11 and 12. Look at what it says. He says, yours, Lord, is the greatest and the power and the glory and the splendor and the majesty for everything in the heavens and on earth belongs to you. I wish we had somebody that could write a song about that. Hmm. Yours, Lord, is the kingdom and you are exalted as head Overall, look at this. Riches and honor come from you. You are the ruler of everything. Power and might are in your hand, and it is in your hand to make great and give strength to all. So, how do you react when a crisis comes along? Panic? Pride? Promise. Hey, Lord. I'm a little concerned about what, hap- what might happen tomorrow. Well, what may happen tomorrow? I don't know. I'm just a little concerned. But you know what, Lord? You're in tomorrow. Hey, Lord, I laid out a five-year plan. I laid out a 10-year plan. Some of you are really good planners. I laid out a 20-year plan. Some of you are like, I got like a five-day plan. <laughs> Do you know God's already there? I can promise you something will not go according to your plan, but he's got a greater plan. And he's moving and he's working and he's saying, just trust my promise. I'm in control. My promise to you as my child is I'm going to work this out for your good and for my glory. For those that are called according to my purpose. So those are common crisis reactions. So what does it all mean? Well, that leads us to the second point, and that is conditions of control. 
By the way, there are three of them too. First of all, creation is controlled by God. Do you know God created everything in the universe? And do you know that God controls everything in the universe? He exercises that control over his creation. You could pull out a telescope, and here's what astrophysicists tell us, that the universe is mostly space. It's just blackness out there, right? Think of how vast the universe is. The moon, 248,000 miles from the earth. The sun, 93 million miles from us. The planet Neptune, 2.8 billion miles from the earth. And this entire time, we are in perfect orbit around the sun so that every 365 and a quarter days, we make a loop. But it's just blank. That's why we call it outer space. You can put away your telescope and now you can pull out your microscope. Students, listen to this. I don't care what Dr. Wigglejaw says in your science class. You can pull out a microscope and all matter is composed of invisible molecules and they're made up of atoms. And those atoms are comprised of protons, neutrons, electrons, and croutons. And it just makes it all work well. And so God has created you and I as intelligent beings. I just want to see if you're listening on that one, okay? (laughs) He's created us as intelligent beings, and you and I are able to study the universe, and we're able to take out the microscope, and we're able, able to study matter. But do you know there's one question that scientists cannot answer? What holds it all together? What 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 keeps us from turning off of orbit? Well, what keeps those atoms from just naturally splitting over and over? And What is it that keeps this whole thing functioning and working the way that it was designed to work? You know the Bible answers that? Science doesn't. The Bible does. And by the way, can I just say this? There are a lot of folks out there that want to sit there and say, well, science and the Bible are are at odds with each other. No, no, friend, listen to me. Science proves what the Bible has already said. They're not at odds. There are so many things today that people want to get us to believe are fact, and they're nothing more than hypotheses. But the Bible answers the question, what keeps outer space and what keeps these atoms What holds it all together? It's found in Colossians chapter 1. Look at the screens. Look at the scripture. Verses 16 and 17. For everything was created by him. That's Jesus, okay? For everything was created by Jesus in heaven and on earth. The visible and the invisible. Whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things. And here it is. And by him all things hold together. The word hold together there in the Greek language that the New Testament was written in. Is the word sunistimi. Sunistimi. It means this. To stick together. Sunistimi, it means this, to cohere. Here's what the Bible has just said. Jesus is the superglue of the universe. For those of you like me who live in Southport, I'll put it in these terms. He's the duct tape of the world. He holds it all together. He holds it all together. You're like, why do you even focus on that? Because you need to hear what I'm about to say today. The very one who holds this entire universe together, keeping it functioning the way it was designed to, is the very one that can hold your life together as well. Will you trust him? Will you trust him? Creation is controlled by God. Here's the second condition of control. And some of you may disagree with this, but you've got to hold on to the third one, okay? But here's the second one. Circumstances are controlled by God. I love the story of Joseph in the Old Testament. Joseph was there. He was loved by his father. He was the youngest. And his brothers got sick and tired of hearing how great he was. 
If you've read the story, you know that his brothers one day said, you know what, we're going to do something about this guy. And so they threw him down in a pit, and they were going to kill him. And all of a sudden, a slave caravan came along, and they said, well, let's don't kill him. We'll sell him to the slave caravan. And the slave caravan carried him away from his family and his hometown and took him to Egypt, where he was a slave. Eventually, he would get thrown into prison. So he goes from the pit to the prison. And then out of prison, he goes to the palace. The number two in command. Some would argue the most important man in Egypt because he was making the decisions. And I want you to hear what Joseph said several years later. When he's finally reunited with his brothers, he said this. He said, you intended this for harm, but God intended it for good. To bring about the salvation of many people. Hey, what you guys did to me, you meant it out of harm. And I took it that way. And I hadn't been real happy about this. But now that I've been looking and I've been watching what has been taking place, that even though you did this maliciously, even though you did this expecting a a different outcome, our God is so gracious. Our God is so merciful. Our God is so sovereign. Our God is so intelligent that God took the evil that you intended. And he said, no, I'll even work through that. I'll accomplish good through what you intended harm. Circumstances are controlled by God. God moves and God works and God is at at work. Even There's a song that we sing, even, even when I don't see you, you're moving. Even when I don't hear you, you're working. Hmm. Listen to what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter 46, verses 9 and 10. Look at the screens. God speaking. God says, for I am God and there is no other. My goodness, amen and amen. For I am God, there is no other. I am God, no one is like me. I declare, listen to this. I declare the end from the beginning and from long ago what is not yet done, saying my plan will take place and I will do all my will. There are a few words that are in our vocabulary that are not found in God's vocabulary. Are you ready? Coincidence. Not found in God's vocabulary. Another one? Uh (laughs) Uh-oh. Not found in God's vocabulary. Friend, listen to me. He has got a plan. You and I look at random events and we look at chance encounters or we look at uh, arbitrary connections and yet they're actually God moving and God working, God orchestrating events to do what? To accomplish his purpose and his plan. You ever found yourself sitting there saying this, especially the older you get? Oh, if I could just go back and do it again. I'd make some different decisions. Well, who wouldn't? We make that statement as though we think we have the ability to go back and we're going to make a different decision that's going to bring about a different outcome. No, no. We don't have that. Why? Because we're flawed. Why are we flawed? Sin. God never said, hmm. God never sits there and says, you know what, if I could go back and do it all over again. His plan's perfect. Circumstances are controlled by God. Creation is controlled by God. Here's the third condition of control. Choices are allowed by God. One of the greatest questions that people want to talk about is, do we have free will or do we not have free will? How do you resolve free will with the sovereignty of God? Well, look in verse 45. To me, we see two groups of people expressing free will in verse 45. There were some who saw Lazarus raised from the dead and they believed on Jesus. And then there were others that didn't believe on Jesus. Instead, they just, they just went to the Pharisees to tell them, here's what Jesus is doing. We want to report this to you. That there were some who followed Jesus, and then there were some who opposed Jesus. I've already said this. I personally cannot understand how someone could see a man who had been dead for four days, Jesus tell him to come out of the tomb, and he come hopping out of that tomb and not believe in Jesus. But skepticism? 
can run deep. And sometimes it's just easier just to, just to kind of explain away stuff. So sometimes it's easier for some folks to say, oh, that was done with smoke, and that was done with mirrors, and that was just a coincidence, and that's not big of a deal. Hey, I honestly think it takes more faith to be an atheist than it does to be a Christian. I do. I do. It reminds me of a story I heard about an atheist. He was out walking in the woods one day in the forest, and he was like, oh, Mother Nature, what you have done is glorious. Oh, look at that tree. That tree started just out of nothing. Oh, the beauty of, 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 the, of, the, uh, of the nature that I'm seeing that came from this explosion. Look at that little frog there. Out of a primordial ooze, he came. All of a sudden, he heard a growl behind him. Turned around and looked, and there was this huge grizzly bear. The bear knocked him down. He pinned him down with one paw. He raised the other paw. He was ready to take his head off and make him lunch. All of a sudden, the atheist, without even thinking, says, Oh, God, save me, and everything stopped. The water quit running. The birds quit chirping. The bear froze. A voice from heaven says, Oh, really? You've spent your entire life denying that I exist. You've spent your entire life making fun of those that believe in me. Matter of fact, you've even been walking around today attributing my beautiful creation to nothingness, that it just happened out of of nothing, and even saying that a primordial ooze brought that frog, and, and now you're sitting here in your time of crisis, you're crying out to me, oh, help me, God? Are you saying that you now believe in me? And the atheist said, well, that, I don't know that I could say that. I mean, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I, yeah, that'd be hypocritical of me to say that now all of a sudden I believe, but, but I find myself in a difficult predicament. God, God I mean, it's, I'm not saying that I, I'm going to become a Christian, but God, could you at least make the bear a Christian? <laughs> and God said, all right, I'll grant your request. All of a sudden, the water starts running again. The birds start chirping again. The bear wakes back up, and the bear takes the paw that was raised, ready to take his head off, and he brings it together, and his hands are like this, and the atheist is like, thank you. He has become a Christian. And the bear bowed his head, and he said, oh, Father, for the food that I'm about to receive, I give you thanks. It takes more faith to believe that there is no God that exists than it takes faith to look around at creation and realize that there is a creator, that there is a God, that there is a God that gives life, and there is a God that saves, that there is a God that knows you intimately, and there is a God that loves you, that there is a God in next week, in next year, and in next decade, and I promise you there is a God that is not up in heaven wringing his hands saying, what's going to happen? to this world what's going to happen to this nation God knows what is coming and that would be Jesus Christ he's coming back again I know we're told if we can just politically get this thing right then we'll create a utopia the only way the utopia will come is when the king of kings and the lord of lords comes back again but God gives you and I the choice to worship him Joshua tells us that. Look at the screens. I want you to look at this passage. Joshua, before he died, he left a charge for the Israelites. Verse 15. But if it doesn't please you to worship the Lord, he's saying this to you and I, but contextually, listen to what he says to them. He says, choose for yourselves today. He says, which will you worship? The gods your fathers worship beyond the Euphrates River or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you're living? And then he says, as for me and my family, It's for me and my house. We'll worship the Lord. God's in control. God created Adam and Eve, and he placed them in the perfect environment. He placed them in the garden. But God didn't make them as robots with no ability to choose. He wanted them to choose to obey him and to love him, but they chose wrong. And they chose sin. And they suffered the consequences. See, guys, that's where you have harmony between free will and the sovereignty 
of God. We are free to choose. Just as these men and women in this text were free to choose. We can either go for Jesus or we can go against Jesus. But what you and I cannot choose are the consequences of our decisions. Consequences invariably will follow according to the program and according to the sovereign choice of God. God has already woven into the existence of this world, into this universe, consequences for those who choose to accept him and those who choose to reject him. Those who choose to trust and those who choose to say, that's all right, I got it all on my own. I don't need any help from you. The consequence is already there according to the sovereign plan of God. But it all boils down to this. Trust. Who are you going to trust? Are you going to trust the world? The government? Are you going to trust yourself? Are you just going to panic and trust no one? Or are you going to trust God and his word and his promise? He's already moving in creation. He's already working through the circumstances. I always find this interesting. When we gather together in this place and there are folks that come to this place that do not know Jesus as their Lord and Savior, don't know, they don't have a relationship with him. And when I'm like, so hey, what brought you to Highland Park? And you know, the answer is like, well, a friend invited me to come or I got a coworker or a family member said come or, you know, I was just driving by and I saw the building over here and I thought, I'll just go in there and see what's going on. Well, no, God was moving and working through all of those circumstances to get you here so that you might hear me say, he's the only one that you can absolutely trust. Who are you going to trust? I'll close with this. I shouldn't have said that because some of you are going to get up and leave now. (laughs) I may not be closing with this. (laughs) Go ahead. Several years ago, Jennifer and I took the kids to Ridgecrest, you know, the Christian camp up in North Carolina. Many of you have been there. I know we've taken our students to camp there before. And Beautiful, beautiful location right there in Black Mountain, North Carolina. But everything is uphill at Ridgecrest. Nothing is downhill. I mean, the main road to go up to the ice cream shack, I mean, my goodness, you're You know, you walk and you walk and you walk and they have all these beautiful rock formations and mountains and it's a beautiful location. We were there and my kids were young and my son, I don't know, he he was probably two or three years old at the time. And one morning I I told my wife, I said, hey, I think I'm going to walk around campus and just, just check out everything and take a look at some stuff. And, and, uh, and I said, I'm going to take Reed with me. And in and, and true mama fashion, here, here's what she said. She said, listen, you need to understand. If he gets hurt, I'm going to kill you. <laughs> you mamas know how you are with your boys, right? And I'm like, oh, he's not going to get hurt. I'll watch him. He'll be fine. And so we're out just kind of walking around. And, you know, uh, he, he starts climbing up this little hill. And it's okay. I'm kind of watching him. And He climbs and gets, I don't know, eight, nine, ten feet higher than me. I'm kind of standing down on this little path. And uh, all of a sudden, I I look off. And the next thing I hear is, hey, Dad, catch me. (laughs) And I turn to catch him in mid-flight. And so I, I like, dove and caught him and fell down. And it didn't knock the breath out of me. It scared the breath out of me. (laughs) And, uh, and, you know, and finally I got my breath back, and he's laughing and everything, and I'm just like, what are you doing? You know, I'm talking to this three-year-old kid, and I'm like, what are you doing? Read what would ever cause you to do something like that. And here's what he said. Because you're my dad. Because you're my dad. Here's what that meant in that three-year-old world. You'll catch me. I jump because you're my dad. 
You're not going to let anything happen to me. I trust you. Because of the trust in his dad, he could live life to the hilt. And, and l- l- look at me. And I'm an imperfect dad. There have been many times where I've looked back upon the, I don't know, I guess our oldest is 23, and looked back and like, boy, I wish I'd done that one a little different. Not, not talking about the kids, just talking about a decision that I made. Dad, am I the only one? Have you ever sat there and said, boy, I wish I'd said that one or said that differently? Maybe I wish I'd not responded that way. An imperfect dad, that'd be me. And yet he was willing to put his full trust. Why, why, why'd you jump? Because you're my dad. You have a heavenly father. That is perfect. If you know Jesus, he's your daddy. And here's what he's saying. I got it under control. You you don't have to panic. You you, you don't have to be prideful and think, no, 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 that's okay, I got it. I'll handle it. I'll fix it. How about you just trust me? And rest easy in my promise. Who's calling the shots? Who knows? But I can tell you this. God longs for your trust. Here's what that means for some of you today. There's some of you in here that you don't have a relationship with Jesus. You've never surrendered your faith and trust to him. You need to trust him with your soul. Forgive me, Lord. I trust you that you can forgive my sin. I trust you with eternal life. I'm trusting in you. There's some of you today that need to make that decision. You're like, well, I, 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 it's not that I've not, not, not chosen him. I mean, it's not that I've rejected him. No, 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 I just haven't received him yet. No, there's no in-between. You receive or reject one of the two. But today... Today you could receive. And then there are others of you in this room. I dare say probably a good number of you in this room. You know him as Lord and Savior. You know that. You know that heaven will be your home. You're just having a hard time trusting him with that crisis. And and, and by the way, I want to add another word to not in God's vocabulary. Crisis. I promise you, friend, he's not worried. Why'd you jump? Your mama's going to kill me. Because you're my dad. Would you stand to your feet this morning? There are going to be pastors down front. You're here today and you say, you know what? I'm right. I'm ready right now to jump in the arms of Jesus. Give my life to him. Would you come? Come to one of these pastors right now. Or there are many others of you. Lord, I'm panicking. Lord, I'm prideful. But today I lay it on this altar and I'm trusting your promise. Maybe you'd grab a friend and say, would you go pray with me? I really need to go pray about this. Jump in his arms today. He loves you, friend.